without any further ado, it's a pleasure, a real pleasure to introduce uh, Chelsea. She has been a um, spectacular student and raised the bar every, every day to new levels. She has, she came from, um, from MIT. She did some work there with uh, Seth Teller and uh, Cy Ravella. Um, and then she, she joined the, uh, the group here at Berkeley. She's been working with Peter Abiel for um, how many years now? Three, just three? My, oh my God. Um, yeah, in three years. I remember when I was in grad school, you know, you were lucky if your advisor like you, you let you publish one paper, you know, maybe two over the course. Um, I think she's got like 20 some. Um, that's probably a low estimate. Uh, she's just uh, she's just been terrific and, and 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 phenomenally on fire. And so she is. Um, she's also been working with companies. She's worked with Google, um, Sandia National Labs. She's uh, spent time at Google Brain. She's uh, so she's working both in um, in experiment in, in commercial labs and in um, research labs and and here. And she's now working with Sergey. She's co-published co-authored papers with with everyone. Everyone talks about their fin number. Um, like, uh, tr and uh, she has, uh, she, she's, uh, she's really become an expert in the, really at the frontier. So she's been in demand at major conferences. She's been giving presentations, winning awards, and she's teaching a course in deep reinforcement learning here um, on campus. She really feels much more like a colleague than a student at this point. So um, please join me in welcoming Chelsea Fitton. Thanks for the introduction, Ken. So today I'll be talking about learning through interaction and specifically generalization in robot reinforcement learning. But before I talk about generalization, first I'm going to talk about deep learning. So there's been a number of success stories in deep learning. Uh, a few of them are speech recognition, image recognition, and machine translation, just to name a few. And the reason why people are so excited about these methods and, and deep learning for these methods is that it works. And in particular, it can handle raw sensory observations. So you can, it can map from the raw audio wave, from the raw pixels in an image, and map to the outputs that you care about. And second, it can scale to the diversity of the real world. So you can upload your own image, you can speak into your phone, and these systems can handle the diversity of, of various voices, various pictures, and, and work well in these scenarios. Uh, but what about deep learning for behavior? Uh, so there's been a number of success stories in deep learning for behavior. Uh, so here's a few of them, uh, learning Atari games, learning locomotion, learning reaching. Uh, and, and these are fantastic examples of being able to learn very complex behaviors in these environments. But one thing you might notice in all of these cases is, is that all of them are in simulation. And the reason why they're in simulation is that uh, they require a lot of experience in order to learn. Uh, and so how can we use deep learning for learning in the real world? Um, so the first set, question that I set out to answer in my PhD is can we use deep networks to learn sensory motor skills on a real robot? Um, and this is the product of that work. So here you can see the robot. Uh, it's learning how to insert the red block into the shape sorting cube. Uh, it's learning from scratch. So at the beginning, it's just waving its arm around randomly, trying to learn about uh, how its actions affect the environment. And then over time, it's improving its policy to eventually be able to insert the block into the cube. And the key to getting this to work and, and working efficiently in the real world was combining elements from optimal control with a novel convolutional neural network architecture that is uh, much more efficient and much more suitable for robotic control. And then using this method, we were able to learn skills uh, like inserting a block into a shape sorting cube. In placing the claw of a toy hammer underneath a nail, screwing a cap onto a bottle, as well as in future work, uh, in follow-up work, using a spatula to lift an object into a bowl. Uh, and, and since then, there's been a number of follow-up works at USC, at Google, uh, at KTH on being able to extend this research uh, to do other types of things and, and, and work in other types of environments. OK, so this is great. We can learn complex skills from scratch in the real world uh, from raw sensory observations. So what's next? What's, what's missing? What's stopping us from taking these methods and putting the robots out into the real world and applying them in, in settings, in, in, in real world settings? What's missing is generalization. So if you look at all of these methods, there's this paradigm of training and testing in a single environment 
on one task starting from scratch. And so how can we learn to generalize to new tasks that we haven't seen before? And also incorporate prior experience in order to quickly adapt to new tasks that we haven't seen before. And so these are the questions that I'm going to be focusing on in this talk today. Uh, so first, can we learn visual models that generalize to new objects and new goals? And second, can we learn models that quickly adapt to new tasks that we haven't seen before? And then lastly, I'll talk about some future work. Okay, um, so first, generalization. So what do I mean by generalization in re reinforcement learning and robotics? Well, first I mean generalization to object instances. So I just showed some work where we learned how to screw a cap onto a bottle, uh, but really what the robot learned was how to screw that cap onto that bottle. Uh, and, and, and similar in, in other work as well. And, and also in the Atari work, if you change the objects in the environment, the policy won't be able to generalize. So can we learn a policy or, or use a method that can generalize to these sorts of object instances? And second, I mean to tasks and, and environments. So there's been work on scaling up robot learning and reinforcement learning to many different objects so that you can generalize to objects that you haven't seen before. Uh, but in these works, you'll find that they learned a, a, a single purpose policy, for example, for grasping, that learns how to grasp. And if you want the robot to be able to generalize to a new task that isn't grasping, then uh, you won't be able to use that experience to be able to better learn a new task. Okay, um, so how are we gonna try and get generalization? So first, we need data. Uh, with data, we can learn how to generalize. So to get data, we're gonna scale up. So this is work that I did at Google Brain, where we had a collection of roughly 10 robot arms, and we can collect data in parallel on all of these robot arms and, and get, data much, get a large amount of data much more easily, much more quickly. And the first lesson with this was that actually human supervision doesn't scale. So in the work that I showed before, we had a human resetting the environment, and we also had a way to specify the reward function. Uh, and that ultimately came from human engineering or, or a human that's kind of with there with the robot uh, providing supervision. But if you want to learn on a collection of 10 different robots, then we don't want to have 10 humans, or if we want to scale up to even more than 10 ro robots, we don't want to have a human for every single robot that's providing supervision and providing guidance during learning. Because that defeats the point of having the robot there in the first place, if we, if we need a human to, uh, to be there for every robot. So where is the supervision going to come from? So we're going to, in this work, we're trying a self-supervised approach. We're seeing what can we have the robots do, and, and how can the robots learn completely on their own, uh, just through their own interactions. Um, and and self-supervision is, is very related to unsupervised learning, and it also uh, sometimes goes under the name of predictive learning. Um, and then lastly, most, as I mentioned before, most deep reinforcement learning algorithms learn a single purpose policy, and that's not going to be able to generalize well to new tasks that you might want to achieve. Um, so instead of learning a policy, we're going to learn a general purpose model that we can then invert to get, uh, to get a policy for doing the particular goal that we want to achieve. Um, okay, and, and lastly, we want to be able to scale to many different objects. We want to be able to learn from raw perceptual inputs, and we also want to be able to learn some notion of intuitive physics. Um, okay, so how is this going to work? So uh, first, we collected data on all of the robot arms. So here's a video of the data that we collected. Uh, and essentially, we, we put objects in front of the robot and pre-programmed motions that were random, and, but random in a way that would encourage interesting complex physical interactions with the world. And we collected the RGB videos along with the actions that the robot was taking. And then in addition to that, we also collected a test set of novel objects that the robot hadn't seen before in order to be able to evaluate how well the robot generalizes to objects it hadn't seen before. Um, then with this, we were trying to actually learn a predictive model using the data uh, that predicts the robot's raw sensory observations. So ultimately, what we want to be able to do is predict what the robot's going to be able to, what the robot's going to see in the future, conditioned on the actions that the robot is going to take in the future, as well as the initial frame that the robot sees. And the, why the, the reason why we want to predict video is that that's that's going to how we're going to use self supervision. That's how we're going to get supervision from the world, um, because you don't know exactly where all these objects are without a lot of instrumentation or a lot of supervision. Okay, so we want to be able to train a predictive model. So here's. Uh, some of the data, and if we look at prior methods for predicting video, predicting future frames, a lot of them are focusing on single frame prediction, so not predicting multiple frames into the future, but just predicting a single frame, or learning a good latent space. And so if you take these prior methods, at least at the time, and, and run it on this data set, uh, 
the resulting predictions are not what you want and, and not good for this application. They might learn a good latent space, they might be able to do single frame prediction very well, but they're not useful for control and that you can't predict it for far into the future. Um, so we want to be able to design a predictive model that's good for control um, and, and, and has the sorts of properties that we want in order to be able to plan with them to figure out a policy. Uh, so kind of the key components of this is that it's going to be action conditional. Uh, so we're going to feed in the actions. We're going to predict multiple frames into the future. And we're going to explicitly model motion and explicitly model how objects are moving in the world. Um, and so the key idea here is instead of outputting pixels, instead of outputting the next frame and generating the pixels from scratch from the internal state of the model, we're instead going to have the model output a transformation from the current frame to the next frame. And that transformation is much simpler than predicting the pixels from scratch. Um, so what this looks like in a toy scenario is say that this is your current frame uh, with a, a red triangle and a blue circle. Then we have a neural network that's going to predict several different transformations for how, that, uh, how different objects in that frame are going to move in the future. Uh, apply those transformations to the initial image. So uh, one of them might be uh, to move things to the right, one of them might be to move things up and to the right. Then also have the model predict what parts of the image will correspond to each of those transformations. So it's essentially predicting a mask. And then at the end it predicts, uh, it combines the mask with the predicted, transform the predicted transformed image to the final image. Okay. Um, and in actuality, the model is a bit more complex than this, so, uh, but the key component is, is that transformation. Uh, but we also use skip connections for more efficient optimization, uh, convolutional LSTMs for, uh, to have a, a smaller, more efficient model, and, uh, and also feed in the, the actions, as I mentioned before. Um, so how does this do? So we evaluated, we trained on, on the data set that I showed before and evaluated on objects that the robot hadn't seen before. And so here I show on the left are the ground truth videos, and on the right are the model's predictions. And what you, the first thing you notice when you look at these is they're quite blurry. Um, the reason behind that is that the model is trained with an L2 loss with mean squared error, so it's trained to encode its uncertainty as blur in the video. But generally, and more importantly, it's able to actually capture how the objects are moving in the image and how the arm is moving in the image. Um, okay, so are these predictions good? Well, actually, video prediction methods, uh, ways for evaluating video prediction are actually quite bad. So mean squared error is not a good way to evaluate prediction quality. Um, but instead, what we can do with these is we can actually use these for control and then evaluate the corresponding control method. Um, so one of the things that you can do with this method is you can actually change the action that's fed into the model and look at what the model is imagining for different actions. So here in the third column, or in the second column, I show the model's predictions for what actually happened, for the, the actions that the robot actually took. But then if you then change the actions, uh, for example, if you decrease the magnitude of the actions, you'll see in the second column that the robot predicts that the objects will move less, that the, the model predicts that the objects will move less and that the arm moves less. And you can decrease it even more and see that the model actually predicts that the object won't move. Um, and you can go in the reverse direction and, and increase the magnitude of the action, and as a result, it predicts that the arm will move faster, that the objects will move faster. Um, so with this model, what we can do is we can plan through this model. Um, and so the way that we do that is say this is our initial frame. First, we consider potential action sequences. So say these are uh, two potential action sequences that we might consider. Then predict the future for each action sequence. So these might be the predicted futures for that action sequence. Pick the future that we like the best and execute the corresponding action. Uh, and then repeat steps one through three to replan in real time. And so essentially what this is is model predictive control. We're just planning through the model with a stochastic optimization method and then replanning in real time to potentially correct for mistakes that the model may have made. Um, okay, so one kind of catch here is that how do we decide which future is the best future? Uh, so as I mentioned before, actually, mean squared error and, and kind of the standard metrics for evaluating uh, a prediction from the model are not very good and, and not very accurate, don't actually correspond to the things that we care about. So how do we pick which future, which video that the robot predicted is the future that we want the most? And the way that we do this is we select where pixels should move. So we 
specify, uh, for example, say we want to move this water bottle to the left, then we specify pixels on the water bottle and say that we want to move them to a corresponding location. Um, and then to plan with this goal, we can then select the feature with the maximal probability of those pixels reaching the goal position. Uh, and the reason why, why we can do that is because of actually the structure in our model. Because the model is predicting, um, the, the model is predicting the mean of a probability distribution over futures, uh, over future motion predictions. Um, we can then kind of predict the probability of a pixel moving to a certain position. Um, so say this is your current image and, and the red pixel is the pixel that we care about. Uh, we can actually, uh, and, and say this is kind of a distribution over that pixel's location. So initially the, the distribution is completely deterministic because we know where the pixel is. It's one at the pixel's location and zero elsewhere. We can then run this through the model uh, for a given action to predict the distribution over where that pixel will end up at future, future points in time. And we can do this for different actions. Uh, so here's a few other actions in the model's predicted probability distribution over that pixel's position. And then actually to plan with this, we can then run an action forward into the future, evaluate the probability of the pixel reaching a certain position, and, and that's our metric for determining which future is the best future. Um, okay, so how does this work? Well, uh, what we do is we just have, here is a video of a human clicking on one pixel and specifying to move the corresponding object to that position, and then the robot plans to reach that goal uh, using the method that I described before. And note that the robot isn't told anything about objects. It's just trying to model how pixels will move in an image using the model that I described before. It's not actually told that you, this is an object and you want to move it here. Um, so if you actually look at, well, how does this approach do? So we evaluated on, on short pushes of objects that it didn't see in the training set, and uh, specifically translations and rotations of objects. And so here are some of the res results. So on the left, I show the goal that was specified by a human, and on the right, I show the, uh, the planning done by the robot. And while, it's, while the planning is quite imprecise because of like, the high dimensionality of the problem, it's still able to actually roughly complete the goals that were, achieved, that were specified by the human without being told what objects are, without being given a lot of supervision from a human. So the approach is completely self-supervised. It's not told, the only human involvement during training is giving some objects to play with and, provide, and uh, programming the initial random motions during data collection. And so I think the takeaway here is that this is a very scalable approach. And as with better models and we, as we get more robots and more compute power, uh, this approach will continue to improve. And so on that note, video prediction has been a very active area of research, especially in the past couple of years. Um, we actually released the data for our model, uh, for, for uh, released the data that we collected on these robots. And even since then, just in the past year or so, there have been two methods that have built upon this work uh, and, and evaluated their method, evaluated their video pre prediction method using the data that we released. And so I think that in the coming years, as we develop better and better video prediction methods, we should be able to uh, kind of expand upon this self-supervised approach. Okay, um, so that was the first part on generalization. Uh, what about adaptation? Uh, so first I talked about zero-shot generalization where you see a new object and you wanna be able to interact with that object without any previous experience with that object. Uh, but what about fast adaptation when you are able to get a little bit of experience with that new object before trying to interact and achieve the goal that you're trying to achieve? And actually there are many scenarios where zero shot generalization is too much to hope for. Uh, so say uh, you're a human, you learned how to drive a sedan in a suburban environment, and then you hop on an SUV in San Francisco that's quite hilly, the car is different, you're not gonna be able to perfectly drive the SUV without any experience in the SUV. You can't just hop in the car and be an optimal driver with that new car. You need to kind of experiment with the gas pedal, experiment with the brake pedal, uh, kind of adapt to driving in hill, driving with hills uh, before you'll be good at driving. So can we use the experience that we learned here in order to quickly adapt to a new scenario? Um, and, and so to do this, we're gonna try and build off of the framework of few-shot learning uh, and transfer learning, where we try to 
incorporate prior knowledge from experience in some set of tasks in order to quickly adapt to a new task that we haven't seen before. Uh, Okay, so there's been a, a large body of work in this area, uh, and, and here's some of them on, on learning an update rule, using Bayesian modeling, memory augmentation to try and quickly adapt to new tasks. Although one of the big success stories in transfer learning has been fine tuning and, and not using these methods. And that's not to say that fine tuning, so what I mean by fine tuning is that we're gonna take a, a network pre-trained on ImageNet and then fine tune it on a new task that's different from ImageNet. Uh, and this works really, really well, and it's kind of the, the thing that everyone does in vision in order to train on a new task. And the reason why people use this for transfer learning rather than uh, these other methods, methods isn't because it's more sophisticated, but it's that it's simple, it works well, and you can just use the same learning rule just for gradient descent starting from the ImageNet pre-trained features. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have ImageNet for behavior. We don't have somewhere that we can fine tune from for learning robot behavior. Um, so can we learn transferable features for robotic learning, for reinforcement learning, um, for a variety of tasks? And also, I mean, fine tuning has really only been shown in the transfer learning setting and not in the few shot learning setting. And so I think even for, for few shot learning for images, I think there's something to be learned from the success of fine tuning. Okay, so how does this look? So our method is largely inspired by fine-tuning. Um, and the way that fine-tuning works is you have your pre-trained parameters theta, which is, uh, for example, your parameters learned on ImageNet. Uh, and then you have a new task, T, and you simply just run gradient descent on that new task starting from the pre-trained parameters. Uh, here I just show one gradient step, but in practice you use uh, several gradient steps or, or more than that. So this is what we want to do at test time. We want to be able to just have our pre-trained parameters and be able to fine tune it on any task that we care about for behavior. So what we can do is we can actually differentiate through this procedure to find a set of, find a set of features that is transferable for many different tasks. And so what this looks like is, say, is, is we try to optimize over parameter vectors such that when we take one or a few gradient steps with respect to a wide variety of tasks, we can get good generalization performance on that task. Um, so we define a set of tasks ahead of time that we, that we care about and, and that we want to be able to transfer to and try to learn a representation such that a, a small amount of data for those tasks, for that task, will very quickly generalize and, and transfer to new, uh, new data for that task. Um, so kind of the key idea is to, is to train over many tasks and learn a parameter vector that generalizes that transfers. Um, so pictorially what this looks like is say that theta is the parameter vector that you're meta-learning and theta i star is the optimal parameter vector for a given task. Uh, during meta-learning what we're doing is we're trying to find a, pr a parameter vector theta that when you adapt it gets good performance. So uh, at this point during meta-learning when you take a gradient step with respect, with respect to a specific task, um, at this point in meta-learning, you're quite far from the optimal parameter vector. But then at the end of meta-learning, when you're right here and you take a gradient step, you're quite close to the optimal. And so we're trying to meta-learn a parameter vector such that we can transfer and adapt to new tasks very quickly. Um, and we call this model agnostic meta-learning. Uh, so we evaluated this on several different domains. So first was uh, few shot classification, which is a, a benchmark task in few shot learning, uh, and is a way to evaluate and, and compare the method to like a large body of prior work. Uh, second, we also compared on an illustrative regression example to see actually what better understand what the method is doing. And lastly, we applied this to fast adaptation and reinforcement learning. And because this is relatively new work, we haven't yet uh, put this on a real robot to be able to adapt in real world scenarios. Okay, so first I'll talk about few shot classification. Uh, so we looked, uh, looked at evaluating this method on the Omniglot data set and on the mini image net data set. And the way that this works, sorry I talked about this a little bit at the beginning of this symposium, uh, but the way that it works is during meta training time, we're gonna try and uh, be able to learn and adapt on a small, a small training set, uh, for example, the first five images up there, such that when we take one or a few gradient steps with respect to those images, we get good generalization performance on classifying the images on the right. 
Um, and so then we apply meta learning or, or meta training on a set of training classes to be able to generalize from only a few number of examples. And then at meta test time, we do the same thing on held out classes. And our goal is to be able to, uh, given these five images, be able to classify what those images are uh, just from one example or a few examples. Um, okay, so these are the results. Uh, this is on the Omniglot data set, which is a data set of handwritten characters. And it was trained on 1,200, tra on 1200 characters. And uh, these results are on held out test classes that were not seen during meta training. And surprisingly, we actually found that our method was, despite the fact that it's quite simple and, uh, and general to a wide variety of domains, we were actually able to outperform existing techniques uh, that are, so some of which, were, which are largely designed for classification tasks and also uh, more complicated than the procedure that we were trying here. And then we also evaluated this on a more complicated data set, mini image net, which is actually real images from the image net data set, uh, although just a smaller set of those images. And we were also able to outperform more complicated methods and methods that were designed specifically for classification. Okay, um, and so second, we tried this on regression scenarios uh, to kind of sh see whether or not it could learn how to regress to a re real valued function. And the way that this works is instead of trying to learn a classifier, we're going to be trying to learn this real valued function. And uh, the training data is now just input output pairs of that real valued function rather than image and labels. Uh, and for this, we were training a neural network uh, that was mapping from the input to the output. And uh, the tasks were a set of sine functions where we varied the amplitude and varied the phase of the sine function. Um, but we didn't tell the neural network that it was a sine function. So it, didn't, it had to learn uh, kind of what sine functions look like. Uh, so uh, in this scenario, we compared to just pre-training on all the tasks, which will effectively average over the output space, and, and then fine-tuning from that initial pre-training. Um, and so first, we'll all look at the five-shot performance. Um, so here's an example curve that it might be trying to learn. It's shown in red. And then the purple triangles show the five data points that it gets in order to learn that function. Uh, and here are some of the, yeah. Um, so here's the curve actually before any adaptation. Um, so this is the curve, this, is, this curve is showing this data, this point in time right here before it's made any gradient updates. And then after just one gradient step using these five data points, uh, model agnostic meta learning or MAML is able to learn how to very closely match the curve just using those five data points. Um, and, and with 10 gradient steps, instead of just one gradient step, it's able to further refine its method. Um, whereas if you just pre-train on all the tasks, it isn't able to adapt effectively uh, because it wasn't trained to do so. And second, the interesting thing to note is that even though if the gradient is only computed with five data points on the right side of the curve, it's able to figure out, it, because it knows the structure of sine functions, it's able to figure out that on the left, it should also have a high amplitude because it saw the high amplitude on the right. So it's not just interpolating. And then we can also look at this in the 10 shot case. So in this case, again, the red curve is the, is the sine function that it's trying to adapt to. The 10 triangles are the 10 points that it gets for the gradient update. Um, this is the curve before any gradient steps. And after one gradient step, in this case, it actually overshoots. But then after 10 gradient steps with those same 10 points, it's able to very accurately match the curve. Okay, um, so what about reinforcement learning? So in the reinforcement learning, the way that we evaluated this is we looked at uh, the, a quadruped, the ant, in, uh, and the half cheetah, and we considered two different problems. One was to run at a goal velocity, where the goal velocity was continuously varied uh, from zero to some upper bound. We also looked at running forward or backward. In this case, it's just two tasks, so we aren't looking at kind of adapting to a new task that we haven't seen, but we're just looking at how we can, if we can learn to quickly adapt uh, and quickly change our policy between running forward and running backward. And for the meta optimization, we use trust region policy optimization, and for the learner, we use vanilla policy gradient. So when it takes a few gradient steps, that's just gonna be using vanilla policy gradient steps. Uh, and then lastly, we compared to three baselines. The first was an oracle, which serves as an upper bound for performance. Uh, the second is pre-training on all of the tasks. Again, that's going to average over the output space. And then last, just take randomly initializing the network and taking a few gradient steps from that random initialization. 
Okay, and then all the methods get 20 tra trajectories or 20 rollouts for computing the fast gradient step. Um, okay, so uh, first we'll look at the goal velocity case. So first I'm gonna show the policy when the network is right here. Um, so this is pi theta essentially, this is the policy with parameters here. This is after one gradient step. So on the left is a goal velocity of zero and on the right is a goal velocity of three. And you can see that with one or a few gradient steps, it's, very, it's able to very quickly adapt its behavior in order to achieve the goal velocity. And if you compare this to pre-training on all of the tasks, uh, it's not able to very quickly adapt its behavior. It's able to ad adapt slowly, uh, but in just one or a few gradient steps, it's not able to efficiently adapt its behavior because it wasn't trained to do so. Um, okay, so next is the forward backward task. Uh, so again, on the top is mammal. So this is the policy before any adaptation on this point in the graph. And then if we take one gradient step on moving backward or moving forward, it's able to very quickly adapt its behavior towards moving backward or moving forward. Uh, and likewise, if you, uh, if you look at this with a random initialization, it isn't able to quickly learn how to adapt its behavior because it wasn't trained to do so. So here's one gradient step for the backward and the forward task. Um, and I'm, vanilla policy gradient is, is quite slow and so it isn't able to adapt its behavior quickly. Okay, uh, and then the last part of the evaluation that I'd like to show is the quantitative evaluation. So this is uh, the reinforcement learning scenario for uh, reaching a goal velocity. And on the x-axis, we show the number of gradient steps. And on the y-axis, we show the average return, where so higher is better. And the green curve shows MAML. Uh, and even though we trained MAML for good performance after one gradient step, we actually see that it continues to improve and continues to uh, kind of adapt its policy after more gradient steps, even though it was only trained to adapt after one gradient step. Okay, um, and so now we'll talk about, a bit about future work. Uh, yeah. Okay, so in, in future work, I'd like to, I mean, think about what are kind of the, the steps towards getting robots into the real world? And I think that one key component of that is continual learning in the real world. So. Generalization and adaptation are very are kind of steps towards getting robots into the real world, but to get continual learning, we need to take it one step further and build a representation such that that's useful for many different tasks and such that when a robot encounters new experience, it can quickly relate that experience to the representation that's learned before, such that it can very quickly adapt to new tasks and, and build a representation that's useful to tasks it hasn't encountered before. Implicitly relating the tasks it's seen, seeing right now, the tasks it's seen before, and the tasks it might encounter in the future. And then I think the second component towards, and Emmo talked about this a little bit, is uh, towards getting robots in the real world is a richer way to specify goals. So one way that I showed how to, one like high level way to specify goals that I mentioned before is clicking on a pixel and saying where we want those pixels to move to. Uh, but if, I mean, if you look at it, this is a very impoverished way to represent the goal. We can only move pixels, and we, we can't give more, I don't know, descriptive things. Uh, for example, say we want a robot to pour water from one cup to another, uh, this method wouldn't work. And, if, in, and furthermore, in reinforcement learning, the, the kind of paradigm of providing a reward function also isn't gonna work, because the real world doesn't just give you a reward function for completing this task. Um, and so one piece of work that I didn't have time to talk about today is uh, an approach for doing this where we can try and infer the reward function from human demonstrations. Uh, so here you see a video of me providing demonstrations from the robot. And uh, in some of my prior work, we developed an inverse reinforcement learning algorithm that tries to infer the goal, infer the reward function from those demonstrations, and then use reinforcement learning to learn how to achieve the goal uh, for new, part, new positions of the cup in this case. And so here it's not trying to mimic the actions of the arm and mimic what was seen in the demonstrations, but instead try to infer the goal and then use reinforcement learning to achieve that goal. Um, but moving beyond this, it'd be nice if we could just tell our robots what we want them to do or gesture towards them and have the robot infer goals from more natural ways to, more natural kind of demonstrations of how to specify the goal. Uh, and, and so I think we need to enrich the forms of demonstration in order to be able to enable learning in more complex and more unconstrained environments. And then lastly, uh, 
in a lot of the work that I showed today, we're learning five second skills effectively. And I think that a lot of the work in robot learning and reinforcement learning uh, also kind of follows this paradigm of learning very short term skills. And in order to put robots in the real world, we need to be able to develop methods that can handle and, and learn much more long term skills. Uh, uh, for example, say we want to have a robot assemble a piece of furniture or tie a piece of rope. Uh, the method that I talked about in the first part of my talk where the robot's pushing things around isn't going to work for this scenario because if you just are applying random actions and learning a model from that, the robot isn't going to randomly happen upon building a piece of furniture from a bunch of tools. Uh, and so we need goal-directed learning in order to be able to learn more complex, more long-term skills, and likely some notion of sub-goals or hierarchy in order to capture more high-level concepts. Um, and then with that, I'd also like to end on a closing note, which is that uh, some of you may not be roboticists and, and may wonder, why, why should I work on a robot? Why should I, why not just download a data set uh, in the, and, and, and kind of train your machine learning algorithm on that data set? I think the reason why is that, and the reason why I don't just download a data set and work on that is that to get intelligent AI and get capable AI, uh, I think that we'll need interaction with the environment in order to develop more capable AI, not just for the fact of building good AI for robots. And a quote that captures this well is, is the following, and it's talking about human development. And it says that the emerging action capabilities are also crucially shaped by the subject's interactions with the environment. Without such interaction, there would be no functional brain. And with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators, Sergey, Peter, Ian, Trevor, Dennis, and Rocky. Uh, and here's a bibliography. Also, all the data and code that I talked about in the projects today are linked on my website. Uh, as Ken mentioned, I'm also co-teaching a deep reinforcement learning course right now. And so if you're interesting, interested in learning more about some of the techniques that we use uh, in reinforcement learning, we have a lot of material there that could be very useful. Thank you, I'd be happy to take any questions. Hey, so I have a technical question. So in a sense, uh, as you are optimizing for the update of the gradient, in a sense, like a, you have the current value of the parameters and then you want to add the uh, gradient at the given point, there are actually in case of reinforcement learning, I see two ways how to optimize it. You can either ask for the reward under the updated model, or you can actually compute Hessian vector product to optimize this quantity as mm -hmm. you are di differentiating through the derivative. And in the sense, I just wonder which one you do or both of them or so. So we're using trust region policy optimization for the meta optimization. So we are using Hessian vector products. Uh, be to avoid the need for third derivatives, we actually use finite differencing for the, the meta optimization to compute those Hessian vector products because we are differentiating through a gradient update. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Just yeah, great talk. So about your uh, vision uh, prediction MPC, I mean, the best way to predict what's going to happen is to actually understand what's happening, and then that tends to give you predictions that generalize. So in this case, what's happening is, yeah, there are pixels, but there's an underlying latent space of reduced coordinate objects, position orientations. Have you, I mean, you could either try to put that in somehow and do the rest of the learning, or at least force the network to like find an information bottleneck where the latent space perhaps would emerge? Yeah, um, yeah. so an alternative approach to predicting and, and, and planning in pixel space is to learn a latent space and then plan in that latent space. I think that's an excellent and worthwhile approach to explore, and actually some of my prior work actually does that. Uh, uh, right now, learning a latent space and learning a good latent space in an unsupervised way is a very challenging research problem, and it's not something that we've been able to tackle convincingly at this point, uh, and so I think that in terms of short-term planning and prediction, planning in pixel space is might be a good approach. In terms of long-term planning, I don't think that planning in pixels is going to be the approach that wins, uh, because I mean, predicting what the pixels are going to look like an hour in the future is is kind of ridiculous. Um, so I think that exploring both approaches is worthwhile for for short-term and for long-term prediction and planning. And if we have a good latent space, then we could also do short-term prediction with that as well. Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> Chelsea, can you say a little more about the last point you made about um, longer term, longer horizon tasks with um, with hierarchies? Because that was also one of the discussions at the breakout. So I'm curious what your thoughts on, on it are. Yeah, so I think that for long term tasks, we'll need to have ways that we can explore, goal directed exploration for those tasks. Uh, one of the challenges there actually is that with learning models, the if you're trying to kind of explore towards a goal, then the model is actually going to become more tailored towards that task and isn't going to be useful for a wide variety of tasks. Uh, so I think that that will be that's going to be one of the trade offs with with longer term tasks. But I think that like having some having high level, higher level notions of of a task and, and and using that to explore your environment to build better models uh, at the longer term will be important. The other thing is I think that uh, we we'll, are often going to want to plan at different levels of abstraction. So the short term planning is going to need to be very precise uh, in order to complete precise tasks. But at the long term, we don't want to be planning at such a precise level. And so if we have a higher level abstraction uh, and, and different levels of abstraction, then for the longest term planning, we'll want to be able to plan at the higher level of abstraction um, and want to be lower and lower for more short term tasks. And just to follow that up, I mean, <clears throat> one question I was curious about is how do you choose the set of tasks when you do the, the learning across tasks like that? Is it, is it important the choice of which set you use, or is it robust to different choices? Are you talking about the meta learning or the the the, the learning the, we have the different the three different directions you're trying to optimize over? Yeah. Um, so yeah, right now we've just specified the tasks by hand, so like a, just a continuous distribution over goal velocities, for example, um, and. Currently, we've made the assumption that the training and test distribution of tasks are going to be the same. So the kind of the tasks that you adapt to are going to be in the same distribution as your training set. Uh, although I think that a method like this is actually going to also outperform the setting where your task isn't in that distribution because the adaptation mechanism is gradient descent, which has all the guarantees of gradient-based optimization. Um, so the worst case will just be learning slower, but we'll still be making progress on any new objective that we might care about. Okay, thank you, Chelsea.